So I got back from lunch and I looked at my phone and I had an email from George Hopkins. The subject line was train. Oh, train. He said, I walked on with three minutes to spare. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so um, I'm very pleased to be introducing George to all of you. Um, you probably know from the emails that he is CEO and general manager at DC Water, one of the nation's largest water and sewer departments, where he's been pioneering innovative communications, financing, and technical um, approaches to solving um, water and sewer and CSO problems. You may not know, but many of you do, but not all of you, that George worked in New Jersey for a long time. He was executive director at the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed Association, and he was also my boss at New Jersey Future for a couple of years. So it's really a great pleasure to welcome George back to New Jersey. Um, he's going to talk for about 20 or 30 minutes, and then we'll have a long time for Q&A. So think about your questions. Um, and Carrie is looking for his presentation. But um, George, come on down. Thank you for the introduction. Chris, I always say that any introduction uh, that doesn't include swear words in it, it's a good one, <laughs> my business. Um, it's a delight uh, to be back in New Jersey. I spent 10 years uh, doing work at the municipal level in, um, in New Jersey and have a great love of this state and come back all that I can. I'm also pleased to be coming back on this topic. Uh, this is uh, quite a relevant day for me to be here speaking to you about combined sewer systems and potential options. The reason I was rushing to a train is that I had a board meeting uh, for our governing body this morning, and we presented our 2016 operating budget proposed to the board, as well as a 10-year capital improvement program. Our 10-year capital, capital improvement program is $3.85 billion. The expenditures in the next three years are $1.6 billion. And of that amount, 45% is for our long-term control plan. So the need to develop, implement, raise the funds for, and construct a long-term control plan is something go ahead, uh, that uh, we work on in DC on a daily basis. Our cash burn is about $3 million a day. Uh, about last month, we kicked off our second giant tunnel boring machine. We named them and christened them. Uh, the first one is called Ladybird. It's been in the ground, works 24 hours a day, six days a week, drilling from Blue Plains, our treatment facility, the largest of its kind in the world, north of the Potomac and down to the Anacostia. The second tunnel boring machine, by the way, these machines are longer than a football field in length. They are 23 feet in diameter. And they are churning under the ground, as I said, 24 hours a day, six days a week. The second one of these machines is going down as we speak. It's called Nanny, after Nanny Helen Burroughs, who was a great educator uh, in D.C. It's going down where RFK Stadium is, and it will be drilling south and will meet in the center near uh, the Nationals ballpark, we hope, like trains going across the country. We have a third tunnel pouring machine, which has gone in the ground in a neighborhood called Bloomingdale, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. because of flooding problems. That's also a combined system uh, challenge. And in order to accelerate that tunnel, because we've had such flooding problems, we actually bought a used machine from Qatar because they take a long time to build. Uh, the, both of our tunnel boring machines cost $30 million each. They are built completely in Germany. They are tested, taken apart, shipped through Baltimore, brought on site, and dropped down a 10-story shaft. 10 stories down to where we're building this tunnel in pieces, assembled as the drilling begins till it's the length of more than a football field, and then it churns along 24 hours a day, cutting into what is mostly heavy clay as opposed to rock uh, that's underneath uh, 10 stories underground. That's the kind of long-term control plan that DC has. It's a $2.6 billion project 
when the costs were estimated in 2002. So what the total cost is when we complete this project, which we hope will be 2030, more to come on that, but at the moment it's 2025, is likely to be somewhat more than that. Although I have to say, in the construction world and cost world, inflation has been quite low, and prices have been pretty close uh, to what we estimated. So we've been on time and on budget so far, even with numbers that come from that uh, time period. The good news for New Jersey, within the context of facing long-term control plans, it is never an easy lift to face any projects of this scale for any municipality anywhere in the United States. You're facing a combination of solutions, no matter what that combination is, that's very expensive. My suspicion is that it has not been built into budgets. It's going to have to be explained, presented to governing bodies, integrated into rate schemes or property tax schemes, depending on how the funding mechanism works, and then uh, contracted and built through. It is no uh, small task, obviously. And I, I was very impressed by the agenda you have today. I know a lot of people who are on it. They are national leaders. I see Andy, my friend from Camden, Carter, who I've known for years. I mean, you've just got some of the best and brightest here providing advice. But there are benefits within that context that you have in New Jersey. First, you're relatively late to the game. I'm not complaining about it or just drawing an observation. Most, many, many of the 772 communities that are facing uh, combined sewer systems are far into their remedy, like we are. We're many, many years in and have many years to go, but we are in active construction as we speak. And communities have tried all sorts of options, which means that you have the benefit of being able to pick and choose among a series of, of options that have had a lot of real-time testing put into them before you have to make a, a choice for your community. That's a great benefit. Second, I'm fascinated by the permitting scheme that DEP is using for uh, the long-term control plan. It's not something that I'm used to. I'm not having any problem with it. We'd love to have it in DC if we could. What's the more standard step in most other places that I'm aware of anyways is that an enforcement action is filed and there's a consent decree that goes before a court that resolves the enforcement action and implements the control plan. That's what we have. We have a consent decree. It was entered in the court in 2005 and it mandates with a court schedule everything that we must do. Now that is, has some benefits, I guess, because we have to do it. There's no questions about it. So when we go to our rate payers, as much as nobody likes paying the price, this is not a choice that we have. This has been mandated. The challenge that we have that you don't have in New Jersey is that we want to change our remedy to be more like some of what you've heard already today. It's happening in and, happen, and is happening in New York, what's been done in Camden, Oneonta County, this very fine paper um, that's been produced, uh, which I read on the train uh, on the way up. Um, there's a tremendous number of options that you can implement up front before anything is in place that for us, we have to reopen a consent decree that's been entered with a court in order to gain the benefits of some of these alternative solutions that you can bake into your solution right at the onset. That gives you a lot of flexibility that for us has taken years. I've actually been negotiating a modification to our consent decree for five years. That's how long it's taking to reopen an existing consent decree rather than having this permitting channel to do this with a planning a forethought up front. Uh, the other benefit that you have is a state and federal agency on the environmental side that in the context of this huge expenditure, which I don't minimize, believe me, I face the public on our rates, have a, have a very significantly different mindset today than they did perhaps five years ago, certainly than they did 10 years ago or 15 years ago. There is no question that at EPA, the interest in alternative approaches to the long-term control plan process, including green infrastructure and all sorts of options, is not only open, that's a desirable choice to include in your long-term control plan. And the city and the state of New Jersey, which has always been uh, forward-thinking in my experience on environmental issues, is the same. 
So you're facing a regulatory, plus there's the integrated planning opportunity to be able to integrate this with other options, other requirements that you have, which literally didn't exist just a few years ago. So the playing field upon which you would do this has changed. Some of this I'm gonna go through really fast because this is my standard, actually not standard, this is very new because we've just been, we think, at the cusp of finally getting a deal on our green infrastructure consent decree modification. And that's changed a lot in the last six weeks with an incredible burst of negotiation. But some of these slides you'll know well, I'll go through them quickly. I don't particularly like that when I'm in an audience, when I'm seeing flies flying through me. But in this case, you'll know why. Mr. Alessio, how are you? Um, uh, uh, you'll know why, because you'll, these are quite issues that you already know very well. Um, we call, by the way, one of the biggest issues, two other issues I'll say to start up front, is number one, because you haven't been enforced to get against yet, and maybe some of you have, but if you haven't, that doesn't mean that can't change. This is something that could end up in an enforcement action and avoid it if you can. So enforcement is always out there. That's the context we're in in a lot of other cities. If you're not, that's a good thing. Try to keep it that way, only because your options are more flexible. You're dealing with a different side when you're dealing in a permitting planning stage rather than an enforcement response stage. Um, so that is very helpful. The second is independent of many water quality, air quality, and all sorts of benefits that come from these new approaches that you've been hearing about um, here today, is there tremendous connections to the community you serve. One of the great reasons that we're interested in green infrastructures, we're building these giant tunnels. They're unbelievably expensive. They do work well. You know exactly their size. You know how to, they're pretty easy to maintain. You can quantify precisely how much you'll capture in them and the rate and all the rest. That's the advantage of gray infrastructure. Let no one say there aren't advantages to gray infrastructure. The disadvantage is, is that nobody sees them. They're 10 stories underground. You gotta get an hour of safety training just to go down and visit one of our tunnels. And it's hard to persuade a, one of our customers, which is how I think of our industry, of what we do for them if they can never see it. If you're doing green infrastructure as part of your long-term control plan, it's something at the neighborhood level, parallel to the environmental benefits, you're doing something that people see, they can understand, people they know can do the work, they can be employed, they can do the maintenance. It is a tremendous bridge between your enterprise and what you're doing and the people you serve. And that is fundamental to DC water. You've probably seen it on my coat. I wear a uniform every day. It makes waking up in the morning really easy. But the very first thing I did when I got to DC water five and a half years ago is we relogoed. We, I think, are as customer oriented as any private uh, sector company. I always compare ourselves to Nike and Adidas, not uh, public enterprises or utilities. We want to be as lean and as customer oriented as any enterprise on earth because we have got to persuade our customer base that what we do matters to them, and therefore they are able and willing to support us. It's not the same as a customer that sells boots, where if I don't like them, I won't buy their product. They have to connect to us. But the reason we are just like a customer or a company is that yes, they have to connect to us. They can't send their sewage anywhere but us, if you're in Washington, DC. But they can fight against rate increases. They can agitate against us in the public sphere. And all of those things to us is our customer response. So everything we can do to communicate better with our customers, including this new logo system, water is life is our phrase, it's all over the city, it's on all our trucks. I used to wear a uniform with our old logo and people used to think I worked for the Department of Corrections for some reason. It was mainly because our logo looked like every other DC logo. You couldn't tell what we did. So we made it simple, DC with a water drop, we, had, we believe our, we're the most important environmental organization in Washington, bar none. We do more to clean the rivers than any other organization in our region by far. And we're the only organization that can say every living organism in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area and every single job in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area relies on us every minute of every day. No one else can say that. And that's part of our initial cut. I'm not going to spend time on this. This is what you already know, the built environment. Our cities are great for certain things. They're not so good for others. Infiltration and stormwater is one of them. Uh, the obvious combined sewer, um, separate sewer. Uh, we actually have both in D.C. I don't think I have that 
map on here, but the older part of DC is all combined. The newer part of DC is all separate. So we have both a big MS4 program for separate sewers and a big combined program for a combined latch. We do have the map. Here's the combined part. It's the magenta, and the separate is around the edges. This is the Anacostia River, Potomac, and the Rock Creek. You see in the yellow spots all of the combined sewer overflow outfalls. We have little red lights on most of them so that we can notify the public when it happens. No one's happy about it. While by far the most in number of the overflows happen on the Rock Creek and then the Potomac and then the Anacostia, the quantities actually go the other way around. The quantity that comes to the Anacostia is by far the most than the Potomac than the Rock Creek. So the quantity is greatest here along the Anacostia. That's because this entire sewer shed, it's the largest sewer shed in the city, all comes through a main sewer line that ends up along the Anacostia. It overflows because of the shear. It's the largest area of drainage that's going to what's called the Northeast Boundary Trunk Sewer. It actually cuts right across the city right about here. What's pretty fascinating about the Northeast Boundary Trunk Sewer is that the reason it's called the Northeast Boundary Trunk Sewer is because when it was built in 1890, that was the Northeast Boundary of Washington, D.C. Before there was rail cars, nobody lived out here. It's too far away. You lived near the core of the city, and the boundary was where you put the sewer because there weren't any houses out there yet. You could build a gigantic hole and put this huge sewer in that starts at six feet in interior diameter and ends up at 23 feet of interior <laughs> diameter. By the time it hits the river, Blue Plains is all the way to the south. So our first tunneling is going up here, the second one's coming south, the third one goes into the city. All the initial phase of the project for overflows on the Anacostia. This is the timing. We started our long-term control plan uh, planning back in 1998, obviously a long time ago. Some, there are many cities who preceded us, and we were not the first by any stretch, but we uh, have been at this a long time. Final control plan was in 2002. There was a very detailed analysis that it meets water quality standards. That's a, that's a tough one. Then we had it lodged with the court in 2005, and we have been implementing it ever since. So we're now pretty far into a 20-year long-term control plan. Many, if not most, long-term control plans that are being done today are 25 years. I actually haven't looked at the permitting process to see how it works in uh, New Jersey, but many cities now, Kansas City, Cleveland, have 25-year long-term control plans, which we are seeking in our modification. Once again, this is the existing plan. This is a gray plan. And once, I, once again, there are benefits to a gray plan. You know exactly what its performance is because the math is beyond me, but someone who's reasonably good at math can do the diameter times the length and all that flow and everything else and tell you exactly how much you're going to capture in overflow events. By far the biggest part of it is this gigantic tunneling system here that goes up into the city. That's where our tunnel boring machine is about right here at the moment. It's traveled all the way up here. The second one is going down here and coming south. The third one will go into the center of the city. We have another tunnel boring machine that's working here right now um, on this part. This is the biggest part. Two-thirds of the overflow of the city are on the Anacostia. It's the slowest moving river. You think it's a pond. If you looked at it most of the time, it doesn't appear to move. So any pollutants in the Anacostia sit there longer. So even it, not only is it a higher quantity, we want to do more here because of the ecological consequence. This tunnel is a shorter tunnel, but it's 33 feet in interior diameter. Imagine this is like a 15-foot ceiling. Imagine doubling this ceiling and then a little bit more. And that's how big the tunnel is supposed to be along the Potomac. And if you know D.C., that's from a little south of the Kennedy Center to a little north of Key Bridge. How we would ever be able to build a tunnel of that size along the Georgetown waterfront is something nobody quite yet knows. And the third was a smaller tunnel um, here up on the Rock Creek. We did a whole slew of projects before the tunnels. That is in the paper here, the nine minimum controls. You actually can accomplish a lot in your city with the nine minimum controls at relatively low cost. We did nine minimum controls at DC Water, did not spend much money, and reduced our combined sewer overflows by a third. Per dollar, without a doubt, the nine minimum controls was the best money we've ever spent to reduce <coughs> combined sewer. It left two-thirds, which is what this system has to cover. But the nine minimum con 
minimum controls is very significant. This is pictures of what's going on now. Uh, this is Lady Bird when it was first being dropped down. That's 10 stories up when it's going down in and drilling into the system. These are the drop shaft that is farther up. You've got to do drop shafts all along the way to get the flow that would otherwise overflow to the river down into um, the shaft itself. It's a pretty extraordinary uh, project. And these are the sheer number of projects that are going along in the city. Um, we are by far the biggest construction operation in Washington, D.C., federal or local. And this is the biggest construction project since Metro was built uh, in, in Washington, D.C. And most of, the, uh, most of the work here, except for the tunnel coming up at the blue phase, is already done. And we're very substantially along in the, in the orange part. Um, this is the uh, performance that we've gotten. And what you can see by the red is that is how much of the overflows we've been able to reduce without building the tunnels. And you can see how much we were able to get in total. We start with a little over three billion. We're now down to two. And we're going to get down to 138. It's one of the most high-performing long-term control plans in the country and also one of the darn most expensive as a result. We actually think we're going to do better than that in actual performance, but um, that's the number we're getting to, 96% recovery, 98% on the Anacostia. That's a very, I think only Cleveland has that kind of performance numbers because of their discharge to Lake Erie. Our discharge is the largest single discharge to the Chesapeake Bay, and that's why we have such stringent requirements.